It's a website there. Essentially, this is a federation of the state facilities. So it's like you know, the Canadian Federation, you know, equivalent federating the provinces. Um, it's, a, it's essentially a joint venture. We are what's called the lead agent for it, which means all the money flows through us, but we have to hand it out to other people. So, I mean, that's, that's the mechanism. It says that for all of these areas, grid computing, data, and compute, there is sort of one peak organization, which is a federation of, of the state facilities. So it makes it very simple because you know who's responsible for what. Uh, VPAC itself, uh, we're a cyber infrastructure company. Uh, we were founded back in about 2001. Uh, we're an independent company. We're owned as a not-for-profit company by all the universities in the state. Um, we do collaborative R&D with the universities and the research agencies. We're what's called a research services company. What we deliver is services. We run compute facilities for the universities. We develop software, both commercially and academic. We avoid competition with the universities because we do no independent research. And by and large, universities don't offer any useful services, well, aside from teaching and research. The universities don't, do, don't provide utility services. Right? Um, we operate most of the facilities in the state, some of which we own, some of which other people own, and they give them back to us. Uh, they realize that running clusters is not, uh, not a fun game. Um, we also operate facilities on behalf of companies such as General Motors, Boeing, and a few others under various level service agreements. Um, it's not socialist, though. People, Americans, when I start saying this, get very worried. They say, you know, this is, this is like healthcare. You know, got to be mandated to use this stuff. No, it isn't. Um, there's no mandate for anybody to use us. Some groups operate their own facilities. Um, and we also don't get state subsidies. We were funded by the state, and we are funded by the state for project-by-project project basis, but we don't, we don't have any ongoing funding from them. Um, but why it's managed to work for us is what's called the economy of scale. You know, if the larger you are, the easier it is to support multiple facilities at once. The problem that small um, e-research service providers have is they've, they've only got one grid computing person, and when they go on vacation um, or get you know, chewed up by a bear or fall off a slope or something like that. You've got nobody there to do the work. Whereas typically we have, you know, two or three or four deep people in most areas to do the work. Um, so we get funded by a number of different sources, universities, state and commonwealth government, um, industry and so on. Uh, we employ over 70 people at four locations in the state. System support, software engineers, scientists and so on. <coughs> we have over 500 users across the eight universities. We run about five or six HPC clusters. We run GPGU systems. We run Viz systems too. Um, the other thing that we do a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we do a lot of software development, uh, but we run it as, as almost like professional software development teams. We have a process in place for you know, gathering requirements, and, and we do what's called agile software development. If you're familiar with that, you especially in the domain of, of e-research cyber infrastructure, people don't know what they want until you give it to them. Uh, actually, after you've given it to them, they probably still don't know what they want or they change their minds. But at least you've shown them what it is that they don't want so that next time when they tell you what it is they don't want, you know it is that they, what it is that they don't want. Something like that. Um, so, so we do a lot of software development. Um, some of it's not for profit, some of it's for profit. So you know, obviously we charge General Motors uh, what's left of it, you know, lots of money if we do development for them. <coughs> so we also do a lot of work with um, the USA and other groups in geodynamics. We worked a lot with the cyber infrastructure group at the NSF at Caltech. Uh, okay, so Victoria has actually got quite a mature um, cyber infrastructure structure, right? The, the universities are organized. They have cyber infrastructure directors. Uh, we all collaborate. Um, and what that's actually meant is that we've, we've had a lot of um, runs on the board, and now the state government and the Commonwealth are injecting a lot more funding. So just in the last um, 12 months, um, the state government and one of the large universities have jointly funded a $100 million centre in computational life sciences. Um, there's another $10 million facility for imaging um, and image processing at the Australian Synchrotron. Uh, we're in that joint venture too. Uh, and there's a biotechnology research centre going in at another location. So the, this is just the state investment alone you know, is stacking up to the 200 million level. The national investment, again, 150, 200 million. Um, 
but, but what's, what we found is that, that once we had runs on the board and successes, we were able to sort of, you know, get to the politicians and convince them that they needed to put more money into cyber infrastructure. So I want to talk about Biogrid now, and I'll just do a little demo of a, uh, of, of a real application that's been great for us. So if I just hit an escape key here. Uh, escape. Hold on for one second. <coughs> so, um, I, I could talk about cyber infrastructure in general, but I thought it was good just to spend five or ten minutes on, on one really exciting production project that we have. It's called Biogrid. Um, the project manager for this is a, a VPAC employee. Um, they're on YouTube. There you go. They must be good if they're on YouTube. Um, and they're at biogrid.org.au. Let's see. So it's funded. Its vision without funding is hallucination. So they managed to get quite a lot of funding for this uh, from the state and federal government. So again, we're talking 11, you know, 15 sort of million. Um, at the moment, too, what they're doing is they've established this rather large network for collecting clinical data. Um, and what this has actually done now is getting investments from the pharma companies. The pharma companies are saying, you guys have got such a large network for getting access to clinical data, we're actually willing to pay money to get access to that network to do you know, data mining and studies you know, of, of effects across large groups. So here's the idea. Um, what you typically have is you've got federal population data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, you've got state health data, You've got clinical data which is gathered in hospitals. Typically, it's by research groups. So the clinical data is gathered by, say, a research group who treats people in, say, cystic fibrosis or colorectal cancer. You know, I'm sure the same situation exists here. You know, different hospitals and different groups will specialize in treating certain diseases. They accumulate fairly large chunks of data over long periods of time. Typically, in the past, they've only used it for their internal purposes. If you just take colorectal cancer in Australia alone, though, they're around about, across the country, around about nine to ten major centres which treat that, which gather that data. So the motivation was being able to federate all of that research data to be able to do much, much larger studies with much greater statistical significance. So the idea is people collect clinical data with scientific tools. These could be you know, samples, histological samples, and so on. Um, then we put it into a virtual data store. The principle that we actually use is that the hospitals still own their own data. If you go to researchers sometimes and say, oh, give me your data, right? Um, they, they, typically, their first question is, well, you can't have my data, but you can have my sister or my dog or something else uh, before you can have my data. So. What we generally do first is what we do is we, we essentially mirror their data or we copy the piece of the data that we actually need. We federate it. Eventually, when they get to trust you more, eventually they kind of say, well, yes, you can have my data. So never go to somebody and say, I want your data. Um, then that goes into research tools which can analyze that data um, and collaborative research across multidisciplinary teams. And then that goes eventually into publications um, and new treatment. So we're actually at the stage, we've now gone to the end of this. There are published results of it. Um, we're now building web tools, for example, that are being deployed based off some of this data to actually do, for example, chemotherapy prescribing. Um, chemotherapy up to now is people scribble something on a piece of paper and hopefully you got it right, whereas we, we build essentially web tools which will, will automate and enable that process to go, working with the clinicians to see what it is they need to do. There's a lot of challenges. Um, ethics is pretty significant, in, obviously, in clinical data. Um, what we've done is we've worked with the hospitals themselves to advance that. Um, heterogeneous systems is a problem. Um, every hospital tends to have its own uh, data system, its own standards. And different groups, as well, will have different classification schemes. Also, for disease, the classification schemes change over time. Right? You can never freeze a medical system Otherwise, you walk along and say, look, I've got a case of SARS. And they say, well, it's not in our computer. We can't treat you. Maybe you should go away and have something different instead. Um, so anyway, this is all problems. Uh, you've got to have people who are champions of this. You know, that's, that's the key. Uh, and usually, 